It is the 50th day of 2023. There are only 315 more. <clears throat> this coming Wednesday, we'll commemorate the birth of the father of our nation. I have no trouble in saying that. George Washington was born in 1732, 291 years ago. As you have heard me say before, it's part of our culture to depreciate the status of the founders because of their relationship with slavery. I choose not to do that. So we honor him. Um, he passed away December the 14th, 1799, at the tender age of only 67 years old. As we're going to head into chapter 10 today, woo I enjoyed chapter 9, not as much as I did chapter 8. Well, I enjoy it all. But as we go into chapter 10, we need to uh, remind ourselves of what Paul had been saying in chapter 9. Remember, these were continuous letters. They were not broken down into chapters or verses. There were no footnotes. They were written continuously. And they were written very tight with very little spaces because uh, whatever uh, media it was being written on, whether it be vellum and animal skin or some kind of papyrus uh, from plants, uh, it was a precious commodity. So they put things together. So things were not broken down into stages like what we have in our scriptures today is convenience to help us find things. I'm glad that was done, or I'd never find anything in here. So um, we need to be reminded of what Paul said in chapter 9. So although he is addressing the Jewish people, what he says about him is true for us here today. I do understand that some things are written specifically for the culture at that time. But we have to be very careful in saying, well, that was for them back, for those people back then. Because we can very easily extrapolate those things. That means bring an application for what was written to them back then into our here today. Sometimes people stretch things a little bit and make them a little unrealistic. But Almost everything that is written here is certainly applicable to us today. If it's not applicable, at least it gives us more knowledge about ourselves and about the Lord. So, these other religions, they, they all hold to some form of afterlife. That's a commonality. Uh, they all believe in a heaven, a nirvana, n nothing to do with a ban. Something, something. And there is a way to attain that. It's based on, for, on performing rituals here in this life, whether they're called sacraments or pilgrimages or all these other things. It's based on works. It is work-based. Work and so we go back for just a few minutes to look at chapter 9, verses 30 through 33, we read this, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. 
There's a distinct contrast between the false religions and the gospel message. And that is that this book right here speaks of salvation being received as a free gift from God's grace through our belief in Jesus' death for our sin. If you want to know what the gospel is all about, there it is right there. The other religions, you, why you can just never do enough. There is always a sense of uncertainty that is fostered within the, the, the priesthood, the leaders of these other religions that you just got to keep doing things because you can never be sure. Be more devout. Be more dedicated. And especially give more money to earn yourself into heaven. And if, if you don't go there immediately, well, maybe you'll, you'll go to some form of purgatory and you know your loved ones who are left behind, if they pay enough money, you will get prayed out of that purgatory. There's no exaggeration here. Yeah, I, there are religions out there, foreign religions that certainly hold to that, but there are religions and they call themselves Christians who hold to these heretical ideas themselves. So, our salvation is based on a free gift. God's grace through our faith and our belief in Jesus' death for our sins. That's it right there. Period. We can all stand up and, or sing a last song and go home and call it good. His grace, our faith, no other religion says that. Why don't they say that? Now, it is true that they would say, well, yes, we have faith, but we also believe in all the, you've got to do all these other things too. The belief that of all these other things that you have to do too also negates the faith. Because as you've heard me say innumerable times, I know when they try to combine faith with works, their faith is not in the Lord. Their faith is in the works, not in Him. No other faith in ours says that. They cannot, they will not accept the Bible's message that God came in the flesh and suffered and died and rose again. Yes, the Jews even today think that's just a form of blasphemy. That God would become man? Oh, not possible. In that, coming in the flesh to suffer and die and to rise again, he made the only way for forgiveness of sin so that you and I can become children of God. Do you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror? I know, terrifying and say, there stands a child of God. Sometimes we need to have confidence in who we are. You, you've heard me say before, the issue of Jesus always revolves around his person and his works. Sometimes we need to understand who we are also. We need to have a good idea of who we were, and we also need to have a better idea of who we are now. Children of God, sons of God, daughters of God. The false faiths. Now, I'm being polite in calling them false faiths. They're actually satanic. You, you can quote me on that. All the other faiths are satanic at their root. They are. You can call them made up, okay. You can call them false, okay. They are satanic. Because our arch enemy, with the techniques that he knows all too well, knows how to portray things to people to get them enamored in some sort of ritual, some something that they're going to devote their lives to and not to the true faith. <clears throat> and so we also have faiths that call themselves Christians. They believe in Jesus. Which Jesus? It has been said, Bob, 
all that matters is what's in people's hearts. And I would agree with you. What does Scripture say about the heart? Deceiving. It is deceiving. Wicked. It is. Now there's an adjective in front of wicked. Desperately, Desperately wicked. And so, we need to come, to come to grips with that. And just because someone says they believe in Jesus, okay, you need to query a little further. Is the Mormon Jesus okay? Oh, no. Is the Jehovah's Witness Jesus okay? Oh, no. For someone to just say, well, I'm a Christian because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we've got a good start there. We need to ask some questions. So the false faiths, like the Jews, Paul is referring to here, cannot and will not accept that Jesus is the only way of salvation. When we had Rabbi Harris here, which is now ooh, some months ago, that was his first ministry, working for Jews for Jesus. Telling his fellow Jews that Jesus is Lord, is Jesus is Messiah. And we've commented before on how the Orthodox Jews react to that. So Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is the offense that the world gives to us. You Christians, you think that you're so exclusive that you've got some kind of lock on heaven and yours is the only way. And we go, yeah. And you try to explain it to them. Good luck with that. Depending on if they are actually wondering or not or if they're just berating us. Both Peter and Paul recognized what Isaiah had said, um, no, sorry, Mike, had said there, right there, the Isaiah quote. The Jews who, were, who had become believers recognized as Peter and Paul did, that quote right there was talking about Jesus, that he would be a stumbling stone, that he would be a rock of offense. The stone the builders rejected has now become the head of the corner. Although the world is offended by him, we who are his brothers and sisters are not. Now, we really focused last week on this part right here, I'm laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. We should not, we didn't emphasize this clause right here. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. When I was younger, did I share my faith? When I was in high school, I did not. I mean, I may as well have. They, they thought I was a dork anyway. I was called the school geek. I didn't even go in the lunchroom. I stayed in the chem lab and played chess. I don't know. Maybe I still am. I did not share my faith because of the ridicule that I knew I was going to get. And going to university, a secular university, oh my goodness, I became a little more bold. I was on an athletic team. Oh boy, did they let me have it. Because there's, they think that there's no greater achievement on their part than to shame us or silence us, better yet, to turn us away from the faith. That's their grand goal. And by doing that, they think that they have accomplished something really great. <clears throat> so we need to Yes, that's all very interesting right there. I like that. But what is applicable to us is whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Keep in mind in all this, Jesus' name is not even mentioned. However, we know who that is, of course. 
We shouldn't be prideful or arrogant about being believers. Have you ever known anyone that way? A little stuck on themselves? There are those out there. There ought to be an ad attitude of humility about us having gone from what we were to what we are now. Neither should those who believe in Jesus be ashamed or embarrassed or humiliated that we are Christians even though the world will try its best to do just that. And friends, it's going to grow. It is happening. Out in the secular world, they wrestle with critical race theory. They wrestle with gender issues. They're, they're in a turmoil of all this, and they try to pass this bill and that bill and state legislatures and so on. That is the world's concern. For, for these things, there's, there's no controversy in my mind. Is there? In the beginning, God created man and woman, period. Is that controversial? Not, not to me, is it? Is it to you? I, I would hope not. There, there's no argument there. So they, they go after all these things and it has now, as we have seen, pervaded into some churches who have now tried to acclimate themselves to what is going on in the culture. And we say, no. We say it in love. Because we look at these people who are in deep, perverted sin, and we say, friend, there is a way for, to find forgiveness for sin. There is a way that you can be forgiven. People who have a firm grasp, a sense of confidence of who they are, tend to be more resilient in their faith than those who rely on their own self-righteousness. Again, we looked at what Peter said in his first letter last week. Verses 4 through 10. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it says in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, they stumbled because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oops. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Our identity is in Christ. You've heard this before. You may have heard that line so much. You know, you, you hear something over and over and over again. Does it become kind of meaningless? You know, the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is the, yeah, yeah, yeah. After a while, it just kind of rolls off us. And we, we, I don't want to say we disbelieve in it, but we lose our dedication to it. So, but our identity in Him, we are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. Now, that's a concept that I don't think we have mentioned before. Or at least enough. Because it's, um, 
Back up here it describes us that we are a holy priesthood. We come down here, we are a royal priesthood. Do we think of ourselves as priests? We kind of shrink at that and go, well, Bob, I mean, what does a priest do? A priest offers sacrifice to the Lord on behalf of other people and for himself. We talk about salvation being a free gift, right? Salvation, the free gift. We don't have to do anything for it. Well, actually, the reality of that is there is a sacrifice that must go on. As Jesus, as I really diverge from the text, Jesus was both a prophet and priest. He offered his own himself as a sacrifice. Sacrifices don't offer themselves. Other people do that, but he did that to himself. So therefore, that is, is his function as high priest. But we too are members of the priesthood. No, we're not Levites. But there's something that you and I need to sacrifice. We talk about salvation being a free gift. Uh, to a point, because there's something that you and I need to sacrifice. And that is what? Self. Our own selves. That, in essence, and I, I know I'm just giving a little, skimming the surface of this concept that we are a holy and a royal priesthood, but this is part of our identity of who we are. A holy nation. A people for his own possession. Remember the concept of remnant that we had over the last couple of weeks? We are that remnant. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are to proclaim. Have you ever heard that Oh, I gotta get it straight in my mind. That old saying, be a witness for Christ, and if necessary, use words. Francis. Have you ever what? Francis of Assisi. Oh, is that who said yes? Did did you know? That's a lie. That is a lie. Yes, we are to be as examples in the world. But by being good people, that's what the world looks at us. Hey, you know, yeah, he, Christians, they're good people. Yeah, look at, you know, he donates money and he does all these good civic activities and they think we're just good people. The moment has to come as that word right there is proclaimed. We've got to open up our mouths and actually say it. You think... They're going to get after you and say things about you to your face and behind your back. Yes, good. Show us what a reaction you have made to them. There, there's someone in the room, and I won't, I won't bring them to your attention, who shared a Bible verse online with some people. Why? He's getting skewered by people who took offense. Good. It, if nothing else, it makes them think. Or at least it makes some of them think. And it makes them responsible to what the truth of the word said. So, I haven't even gotten to chapter 10 yet. Stop distracting me. We, we start at chapter 9 with Paul's emotional confession about how his heart is broken that his fellow Jews would come to faith. Mike, can you, I know it's not on the slip, can you go back to um, chapter 9, verse, verse 1? I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Okay, so he starts off the chapter with this, with this heartfelt cry for his fellow Jews. His heart is broken for them. So he uses the expressions, 
great sorrow, unceasing anguish, to describe what he feels for them. These are the people who are persecuting him. His own, his own fellows. Yes, some of his persecutions did come from Gentiles, but it was mainly the Jews. They are the ones who plotted and schemed and had him, had him jailed and uh, plotted to take his life. So we, we start chapter 10 with Paul saying much the same thing and also giving reasons for the lostness of the Jews. Chapter 10, the first four verses, brothers. My heart's desire and prayer to God is for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. First one stands out. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, his fellows, is that they may be saved. It can't help but go through my mind a question. For those who are not saved, and everybody in the room knows somebody who is not saved, right? Let them come to your mind at this moment. Their faces, their names. Do we have what Paul says he has for people who wanted him dead? Do we have his heart's desire that they would be saved? Anguish. Heart's desire. Is that our, and notice my adjective, fervent prayer? Is that a fervent prayer to God? Is it a real concern to us that those we love and those that we don't, we are to pray for our enemies? Is it a concern to us that they would be eternally in a place of torment and judgment? Well, no, no, Bob. Our heart from the lost, as we once were lost ourselves, might just be an indication of the sincerity of our own faith. If we're not praying for the salvation of others, what does that not, not say about them, but what does that say about us? How do I regard my faith? Is it something personal, something private? Oh, we don't want to wear our faith on our sleeves. If I truly, with my whole being, know I am saved, then I will have an unserved longing to tell others about how they too can come to know eternal life. Unreserved longing. Paul then goes into the primary reason the Jews will not believe. Verse 2. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. That last part is somewhat quizzical. They have a zeal for God. Okay, that's good, but not according to knowledge. We go, what is that? Keep in mind, Paul being a Jew, having been a Pharisee, the religious police, who had great authority. Paul could speak to the fact that his people were both very religious and were yet far from God as he was. Being religious for what you believe in what you believe in would seem to be a very admirable trait, would it not? We think of the dedication of some of the world's religions all the things that people go through to do all these, these different things, we think that that's quite an admirable thing. 
after a Mormon young man graduates from high school, what, what does he do? He goes on a three-year deputation? Witnessing, right? Something like that. Uh, that they go knocking door to door. And people look at that and go, oh, they're so dedicated to their faith. The reason they're so dedicated is they're trying to work their way into heaven. People will admire and compliment anyone who is sold out to what they believe in. To be zealous, we have that word in verse 2. To be zealous means to have great enthusiasm in the pursuit of a cause. Paul had, has a sincere zeal for not his salvation, he already has that. He has a zeal for theirs, that they would be saved. Yet their zeal for God was based on false concepts about him. It has always been a puzzlement in my mind. I need to ask this of someone who could explain it to me. Why, with all the numerous fulfillments of prophecy Jesus did, did they not see those things and acclaim him as Messiah? I know their hearts were darkened. But for a group of people, especially who were educated in the scriptures, who knew them forward and backwards and inside out, that their minds could be so blinded to the fact of Jesus' fulfillment of the prophecies is to me still, as I look at that, and even today, how the Orthodox Jews especially can look at the person of Jesus and his fulfillment of their prophecies and ignore that. I'm just befuddled. But again, that's what sin does. It blinds the eyes of people. False concepts. This is what he means, zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. The knowledge that he is speaking of and that the Jews lacked was that their scriptures from front to back pointed to the fact that Jesus was their Messiah, that he was God incarnate. He was a sacrifice for sin. He fulfilled all the prophecies and affirmed his person by a drove of miracles. It's easy for someone to say, I am Messiah, follow me. There were numerous false messiahs before Jesus and after him, in case you did not know that. But they were spouting words. Jesus backed up what he said, his claim to divinity that God was his father by the miracles. Miracles serve two purposes. They, of course, help people. Whatever was done, it was a benefit to people. But it also gave proof, an acclamation of who he was. It, validated, it gave validity to his person. So this is the knowledge that the Jews were lacking. So educated in their scriptures, yet so blind to the purpose and to the person of Jesus. That was the knowledge Paul says the Jews lacked. Their zeal for God was actually pride in their own person. Being Jews, being circumcised, keeping kosher, keeping Sabbath, keeping this and doing that, theirs, even to today, is works-based, not faith-based. Paul knew this well. He was an example of misplaced zeal. I, I would think probably most of the people in the room know Paul's background. Talk about zealous. This guy was the epitome of someone who was dedicated to a cause, and that cause was eliminating the scourge of these people who believed in Jesus. We look at Philippians 3.6. What he had to say about himself. As to zeal, a 
persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. He said, I keep every jot and tittle of the law. But his zeal was to persecute the church. In Acts, he said this about himself. This is all after his salvation. Chapter 26, I myself was, was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in, notice his attitude, in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. That's Paul. As he looks back on who he was, a devoted, devout, blameless Jew who had reached the pinnacle of his profession. He had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. He thought he was working on God's behalf to, to rid the planet of these followers of Jesus. He was absolutely certain that the things he did against the followers of the way pleased God. But then what happened? He met Christ on the road. So when he was being persecuted by his fellows, he understood it well having done so himself. As we probably understand, fanatics can have a zeal for God and yet be entirely wrong. The old saying is you can be sincere in what you believe and yet be sincerely wrong. They can deceive others because they themselves are deceived. A prime example of false zeal for a God, small g, are the willing martyrs for Allah. I even find Christians using the name Allah to describe the God of the Bible. Well, the word Allah is generic. It just means God. It's like, don't use that, buddy. You need to get clued in. Allah is Satan. And there's no better example than to have a religious zeal than these people who believe that they can sacrifice their lives killing the enemy and they're going to spend an eternity in a blissful heaven. Their satanic God assures them of a lascivious eternity if they perish for the cause. We think of zeal today. College football. We think of sports in general. Football games. Have you seen some of the people that get on camera? They're absolutely nuts. Body paint, signs, all kinds of things going on. And it's true around the world. They have a God to worship. The God of sport. I, I once shocked an administrator. My former principal. She just didn't understand how people were just so much into sports and how it just dominated everything. And I, I looked her in the eye and I called her by name and said, you don't understand? To a lot of people, sport is God. I really riled her that day. It was wonderful. Zeal. We see it in athletics. We see it in religion. When we find someone who's devoted to the cause, we need to ask if their fervor has been imposed on them by someone else. For example, a, a strong personality. 
This is very typical of cults who become fanatical for the cause. They have listened to the teaching of someone and who have, they've not only bought into it, they've sold themselves out to it. And so they follow strong personality. Uh, other examples of false zeal is they have a complete intolerance of other people. Uh, gullible people who lack purpose can come under the sway of a very strong personality. I think of the example of Jim Jones. Many in the room here uh, are not acquainted with that name, and I can't go into detail. In 19, the middle 1970s, Jim Jones, a minister, moved his congregation from, I think it was San Francisco, to Guiana, South America. And one thing led to another thing. And if you've heard the expression, drink the Kool-Aid, that's where that comes from. At his behest, over 900 members of his congregation drank the Kool-Aid and died. You can find pictures of, of the bodies online. It is a tragedy to see that 900 people, because of their fervency in the belief and their dedication to one man, would take their lives and the lives of their own children too. Other things, false zeal, uh, they put an emphasis on doing rather than being. Yes, you and I need to engage in service for our Lord in all different forms, but that needs to stem and grow out of who we are first of all. We are transformed first. Service then follows. Their focus is on activity. There can be an excitement of being in a service that is in high energy excitement uh, as conducted by pros who know how to exploit people's sense of emotion. I'm now res referring to a lot of church services that are going on. It is the trendy cool thing to have a high energy so-called worship service. And these musicians are professional. They know how to manipulate the crowd that is sitting out there with strobe lights, smoke machines, cameras, volume. They know how to vary the music to go from down temple to up temple and then back down again. And these people are pros. Look, I've been in these services. I'm not up here talking about something that I have not seen myself. The emphasis is on the music. And people have great zeal in those areas to, to the depreciation of the word. So we were arriving late. This was in another state, going into the service. The windows were all open. The music was all pouring out of the windows into the parking lot. People were coming in from the parking lot, other latecomers, and they were already moving and grooving to the music out in the parking lot, down the hallway. And oh, once they got into the room, why it was unrestrained. Bob, are you trying to quench the Holy Spirit? I am talking about misplaced zeal. We, and they walk out saying, boy, I really feel as though I've worshipped. Is, is worship about us? True. I certainly can benefit by worshiping God. True. But it is for his honor and his glory. So, uh, going on. False zeal dislikes being questioned. It says, how dare you question me? Can't you see my sincerity? The adherents would say, their sincerity validates what they believe in. Not necessarily. 
and they turn it back on you and question your devotion. These folks have a lack of balance in their faith. And this can, as we said, be true of Christians. They overemphasize one aspect of the truth to the neglect of others. They may be diehard Calvinists. That's all that exists. They may be devoted Armenians. They may promote gifts. The measure of someone's spirituality is manifestation of the gifts. So, they're not interested in anything else. Their pet dogma dominates their lives. That is a false zeal if we are absorbed in any one thing. Invariably, one can become heretical. We're told in Acts 20 that we are not to shrink from declaring, listen to this, the whole counsel of God. And people who have a false zeal, they're very restless folk. Uh, they go gangbusters for a while, and then they cool off, usually because they haven't gotten their way with leadership, and then they move on so that they can have a new experience. However, one who is zealous for the truth of God never puts a, a veneer puts on a veneer, a covering, an, an, an outer uh, portrayal, a false one, for the sake of others. A true zealot recognizes that emotions can be deceiving and are temporary. We usually think of people who are very fervent and zealous as being, they're really emotional, they're jumping up and down, they're loud, they got to kind of hold them down. Not necessarily. True zealousness for the things of God are characteristic of those who are quiet, who, may, who don't make a scene. They're not the life of the party. Yet there can be that fervency that is burning within them for the Lord. So, the true zealot recognizes that emotions can be deceiving. They are more concerned with the outcome of knowledge of Scripture, which goes from their own minds to comprehend to their hearts to transform and their will to service. We can't allow things to just play on our emotions. We are people with minds and hearts and also wills. And the Holy Spirit engages us in all of those. So, we're, we don't become crazed fanatics. We are obedient children. Romans 6.17, this is something that we've done a while ago. But thanks be to God that you who are once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. We are to be obedient. Emotional things are not an indication of the sincerity and the validity of one's faith. The real zealot knows what he is doing and why he is doing it. He's functioning as 10.2 says, according to knowledge. His passion is also controlled. Instead of making a spectacle of themselves, he knows that it is the day-to-day -day consistency of abiding faith that is of more value to God than religious fervor. Another note from Asbury. Some came in and were making an effort at speaking in tongues. That got shut down, and I'm told they were escorted from the building. So we're not looking for a spectacle. It is the quiet, day-to-day, -day, consistent faith 
that God wants from us. That is of the utmost value to him. So that is being truly a zealous man and a zealous woman who believes according to knowledge. And they are humble people. It may seem ironic, but true zeal is marked by a lack of confidence in ourselves. We seek his strength and direction. To be self-assured may be a sign of pride. There's always that aspect that we need to have a little confidence in what's going to be accomplished only because God is working through us. Anytime I would be tempted, well, I'm just going to get up here and wing it. That's a recipe for disaster. We, we look at Paul again. We think of him as being confident and forward and domineering. And no, look at what he said about himself in 1 Corinthians. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Do you see his depreciation of self and a promotion of the Spirit of God in what he has said here? But it, it kind of befuddles us. Paul, weakness, fear, trembling. That was him in himself. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, he accomplished great things for the sake of the name. That was true zeal. The zealot for God, what is his motivation? We want results. We want a big church. We want a name that goes across the country. We want to be on television. We want the parking lot to be overflowing. We want... Is, is that our motivation? Is that what we want? What ought to motivate us is the glory of God. Now that's our heavenly motivation. We want to extol his name for all that is done, it is done through him, because of him, and for him. That's the heavenly motivation. There is an earthly motivation that we could have, an earthly one that is people come to the knowledge of the truth. And from that knowledge, they may come to faith in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. To those two ends, we must be devoted to salvation for people, for God's glory. They both go together. That's something that you and I can be zealous for. Not that we gain a notoriety for our own self, but that God is honored that the souls of men, women, boys, and girls are saved in his name. Having said all that, the reality is, on our own, we are unable to nurture a fervent spirit on our own. If we do it, it may be a false zeal that is not going to last. A true fervency for the things of God, God has to be raised up in us by the Holy Spirit himself. He is the one, not ourselves, who reveals truth to our minds from the word, and that truth moves our hearts and then moves our will to action. So we need to ask, what effect does this have on you? Paul's concern that was that his people had a zeal for God, but that it wasn't through Jesus. That was his concern. The concern today is that we have a faith in Jesus, but that we lack the fervency of spirit to share that faith. 
That's a matter of prayer, of course. It's also a matter of understanding as believers who the focal point of our lives is. And having recognized who the focal point is, a zeal, a fervency will be grow, begin to grow in us from the Holy Spirit that even in the face of opposition or ridicule, we can say as the disciples said, here's what they said when they were hauled in front of the Sanhedrin. We cannot but speak of the things we have seen and heard. We can't help it. And the Sanhedrin took note that they had been with Jesus. Jesus.